I'm going to put into words what we've just shown algebraically. Okay? So if P of X, any polynomial you like, is divided by a monic linear divisor, which means x minus a. Okay? If that guy is divided by x minus a, then the remainder's theorem states, unsurprisingly, the remainder is, what's it equal to? Have a look. How do I find it? It's p of a, whatever that happens to be. Okay. By the way, using the language that we already know, we've developed right from the beginning, um, I can say it's p of the zero of the divisor. Do you see that a is the zero of this polynomial? Here, you put in a, poof, it's gone. Okay. So that's the remainder theorem. Okay. Now my question to you is, don't write anything down, just have a think about this with me. My question to you is, what if you tried this? What if you put in a number? And um, your remainder happened to be zero. What does it mean when you divide through something and you get all the way to the end and your remainder is exactly zero? You know? If there's no remainder, it's a factor, right? For example, if you took um, if you took seventy, right, and then you divided it, uh, sorry, you divided it by five, right? You go, okay, uh, once five. 0, 20, 14. And then you go again, and you're like, 4 times 5 is 20, that's 0. Oh, I've got no remainder. That means 5 is a factor of 70, yeah? So if I'd gone through this whole process and the remainder was 0, I haven't found like this long statement. I've got a factorization. I have a factorization. Well, we've spent a lot of our life trying to find factorizations. So really, the remainder theorem is actually just a stepping stone. It's a stepping stone to what I really want is for this thing to be zero, okay? Which is this guy, this corollary. It's called the factor theorem. So directly underneath here, you can make a new little subheading because it ends up being the point, really. The remainder theorem is not that useful. It's useful specifically when the remainder is zero. So the factor theorem states, if P of A equals zero, in that special case where you tried it out, and you're like, ta-da, no remainder. Then x minus, I didn't need the bracket. Why don't I put that there? x minus a is not just something I divided by. It's a factor, hence factor theorem, of p of x. Okay. So what's the remainder theorem say? It says if you want to find the remainder quickly, you don't have to go through the entire division process. Just put in, substitute in the right number, and then you will get out the remainder. Ta-da! But where this is really most useful is where the remainder you get happens to be zero. If there's no remainder, it's a factor. So let me give you an example of this, and we'll actually work through the whole question. Okay? Can you write this down? I need more space, but I want you to write down the question first. So here's a polynomial, p of x. So if this is the polynomial that we get given, up until this topic, if you were trying to do something with this, well, I suppose you could differentiate. Um, that'd give you some stationary points, that kind of thing. Uh, but usually I need like intercepts, and that kind of requires a factorization. As a cubic, I don't know what to do with it until now. Okay? The factor theorem, and the remainder theorem along with it, give us a quick and relatively efficient way to find out how to factorize this. Right? What I want to do is I'm just going to throw numbers at it until this happens. Okay? Now, admittedly, that is a bit like that's, there's a randomness and a time consuming part to that, which means that we will craft, like I've crafted, um, we will craft polynomials for you such that you're not throwing numbers at this forever and um, like, oh, I got to 100. Ta da! I found it. Okay? We'll make it relatively easy to find, but there is an element of trial and error here. Okay? So here's the way we're going to begin we're going to test a particular number. This is me trying out different things to see if I can find a factor. Okay? I'm going to start at 1. Um, 0 is kind of like a natural place to start, but I don't need to test 0 because you can already tell me what p of 0 is, right? p of 0 is 21 because all of this disappears, you just get left with the constant. Don't need to test that. I'm just going to go straight to the next smallest number, okay? Let's see what happens. I get 1 plus 3 minus 25 plus 21. 4 
plus 21, that's 25. Oh, how convenient. It's zero. Now, like I said before, we will craft this on purpose, okay? However, you might not get lucky the very first time. If you don't get one, rather than going one, two, three, four, I'd probably advise you go to negative one. So you just wanna stay nice and close to the origin because smaller numbers are just easier to deal with, okay? So uh, we got it on first go, isn't that nice? Uh, but you would have to go further and further out. I don't think you'll ever find anything further than three. And to be honest, in an exam, you probably wouldn't find anything further than two. We're not trying to test your perseverance. We're trying to test your ability to understand this um, theorem, okay? I've found this. What does the factor theorem tell me that that means? Therefore, what's a factor? X minus one. X minus one is a factor. Okay, I tested positive one, but that's a, so this is my x minus a, it's a factor. Now when I know that it's a factor, I can actually divide through, right? Because if I divide through by this, what was it? x cubed plus 3x squared? Is that right? Okay. Just, just see where I'm going here, right? Before we actually go ahead and crunch this, what do you expect the answer to be up here? What do you expect? There's going to be, this is dividing degree 3 by degree 1, so you're expecting degree 2 with remainder 0, because that's what I just found out. You're going to end up with a quadratic, and you guys could do quadratic in your sleep, right? So I've taken a question which was insoluble before, and reduced it down to one which you're quite comfortable with. Okay, so let's just go ahead and do the division. Uh, first thing to write up here, x squared is how many times I can fit x into x cubed. I will multiply, uh, that's a minus. Okay, now I'm going to subtract. That gives me 4x squared. How many times does it go in? Plus 4x. Now I'll multiply back. 4x squared minus 4x. Watch out for the double, triple, whatever negatives there are. Okay, what is the subtraction? Minus 21, yeah, negative. Okay, good. Does that look okay? How many times does that go in? negative 21, and as a relief, ta-da, we get our remainder of zero just like we expected, okay? That's good. From here, I can make this division statement, but my remainder is zero. So therefore, it's actually a factorization. I can say that p of x is equal to uh, x minus 1, x squared plus 4x minus 21, bracket, and I can factorize this further, right? Uh, what pair of numbers am I searching for? 7 and negative 3, uh, yeah, negative 3. So that gives me x plus 7, x minus 3. Now that you have a factorization, you can do everything you need to. Like the follow-up question for this would be graph. Um, you probably would have had to go to here to find stationary points and all that kind of thing, but you're done. Does that make sense? So just to quickly review, why did we establish all of this theory? Okay. It's basically so that we can start tackling these because before, if it wasn't a quadratic, you were stuffed. Like you can't factorize. Okay? But the factor theorem tells you, throw some numbers at that thing until you find a remainder of zero. Once you do that, off you go and you'll reduce it to a question you can handle. Okay? Any questions? Ah, okay, good question. This is gonna be so quick, and we've done all the hard work, we might as well just quickly do it together. Draw yourself a set of axes, okay. What's the point of factorization? Well, if I were graphing y equals that, then every time x equals one of these zeros, okay, I will get an x-intercept, right? So from this I read off that my x-intercepts are negative seven, one, and three. Negative seven, let's put that guy over there, and 1 and 3, roughly, okay? Negative 7, 1, 3. This is a cubic, so it's either going to go low to high or high to low. Which one is it? It's, it's low to high because, which is the number, that, there's a single number here that tells me that's the case. It has a name, that's how important it is. It's the leading coefficient, yeah? It's positive, so that means it's going to have this, um, this positive shape here. Um, I've got three x-intercepts, but I might as well, while it's easy, find out what the y-intercept is. What is it? 
It's gonna be 21, right? Now, I'm not gonna put, paint myself into a corner. I'm just gonna draw this shape, and wherever I hit the y-axis, I'm just gonna make that 21, right? I'm, rather than make a 21 and then try and get there, and then you have to rub out and all that kind of thing. So let's see, I'm guessing something like this. Ta-da, I'm calling that 21, okay? Um, because you know calculus, because you know calculus, you can find, and you pretty much are expected to find, those two stationary points, okay? And just a bit of a heads up for you. We can quickly differentiate this. Uh, that's P of X, so where have I got space? I have space here. What's P dash? 3X squared, yep, you can read it off for me, right? 3X squared plus 6X minus 25. There we go. Now, when I have a look at that, no factorization jumps out at me. As a general rule, if your x-intercepts are nice numbers, your stationary points will be gross numbers, <laughs> okay? Or vice versa. If we've given you something so that the stationary points are easy to find, the, um, the roots will be disastrous to find. In fact, some of the questions you may have even noticed, they say, do not attempt to find the x-intercepts, okay? Because remember I said to you, oh, we crafted this, so you'd find this quickly. Right? But many polynomials, just they don't even have integer roots at all. So you will never guess, because they'll all be um, weird square roots and all that kind of thing, and you can't you know, throw things at the wall and expect to find those. Okay? So yeah, these stationary points are going to be a little bit gross. You're going to have to find, use them doing the quadratic formula, but then you can find those, and they would, these would be subsequent parts of a later question, so that's why you'd spend some time on it. Okay? Does that answer your question, Russell? Yep. Maya. Do you mean when we're doing this? Yeah, like yeah, fantastic. Okay, let's um, let me restate that question and see if you guys can help me answer that. Okay, Amaya's question was: When doing this testing process, is there more than one um, that will give us this result? Think, think about this. Think about what the factor theorem says, and you should be able to answer that question for me, right? How many factors does this have? It has three. So if you're some kind of um. <laughs> If you're, um, if you're some kind of weirdo who's like, I just like the number seven, and let's just be negative just, just for the sake of it, right? Well, let's have a look and see what happens. Um, that's going to be minus 343 plus three lots of 49 minus 25 lots of negative seven plus 21. I'll put some money down that that's zero, right? Because look, I've already, I already found that it's going to be a factor. And of course, if I had tested three, it would also give me a factor. Um, what will then result, of course, is that I will divide my original polynomial by something different. I will divide through by, like, say, x plus 3, dot, 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 right? So, of course, your quotient will be different, but eventually we'll all factorize to get this guy because that is the unique factorization. Make sense? Yeah. But, of course, you want to find the closest one because small, small numbers are less gross than big numbers. Okay. Happy?